Remember earlier I said mental chemistry or medical hypnosis? You picked mental chemistry. Was that the right choice or the wrong choice? Right choice. Right choice? Okay, great. Now you don't get a choice. It's medical hypnotherapy. And I want to make sure before you leave here this afternoon that you actually create hypnotic phenomena and guide somebody else through experiencing hypnotic phenomena as if they were a client. Because one of the most powerful ways to transform clients, no matter what their medical symptoms are, no matter what their medical distress is, or what they're anticipating medically in the future, when we utilize hypnotic phenomena, we create powerful transformation. I don't think it's enough to simply talk to clients. Okay, we need to demonstrate, what the reason why hypnosis is effective is because it produces hypnotic phenomena. We'll talk about more of that tomorrow. A stage hypnotist, their entire show is based on, let me show you hypnotic phenomena, first perceptual changes, right? Uh, it's hot inside, but you feel like you're cold and your teeth are out, actually chattering. You can't make your own teeth chatter. It's an autonomic nervous system thing. So we know people are really hypnotized because their teeth are actually chattering when it's 73 degrees inside the theater, 75 underneath the, the theater lights, and their teeth are actually chattering. So we have perceptual changes. We have negative hallucinations. A stage hypnotist will do it this way. And from this point forward, I'm invisible, but the red cup I'm holding is completely visible. They don't see me, but they see the cup, and they're amazed by the power of the floating object, they're doing a magic skitter routine. Um, uh, um, uh, heightened awareness of senses. So the smell they smell becomes an overwhelming smell, right? The per, you know, stage hypnosis show being silly. Person next to me farted. It's the worst fart you ever smelled. You know, don't gack on stage here because we don't want to clean it up. But you know, you get these dramatic responses. Um, a stage hypnotist, their entire show is let me, in an entertaining way, take you through the list of hypnotic phenomena. Okay. We're not going to entertain our clients. Although, let me say this. Milton Erickson did a lot of hypnotic phenomena because it was fun for him to do. Mm. Okay? Uh, uh, it is sometimes fun to do hypnosis with people. You will have clients say, oh my gosh, that was so cool, and I'm going to show you something in a few minutes that I think you're going to say that is so cool um, because you're going to experience it and you're going to be able to share this with your clients. But before I do that, I want to share with you the formula for effective medical hypnotherapy. Effective medical hypnotherapy really is not complex. It is a mathematical formula. And the first thing is compassion. Our clients don't come to us either in behavioral health or in physical health the way they could be, should be, ought to be. They come to us the way they are. In dealing with medical issues, by the way, this is in your notes, so you do have a copy of it. Um, <coughs> the notes are uh, somewhere on a page titled Medical Hypnotherapy. We're going to deviate from the notes, but this is actually on there. Um, uh, our clients medically come to us not where they could be, should be, or ought to be. Maybe they have a life of not taking care of their own personal health. And now they're experiencing the problems associated with that. And I woulda, coulda, shoulda 30 years ago taken care of my health in a different way if I knew I was going to live to be 54. I mean, that's just kind of the way mindset is for people, right? Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we may die. And then suddenly you're 72 years old and you never died and you're like, wow, maybe I shouldn't have been quite so merry. Okay? So our clients come to us not the way they should be, but the way they actually are. We have to have compassion for that. Um, there are a lot of different medical situations where medical professionals truly lack compassion and they blame the victim. Nobody ever set out to have a miserable life. Nobody set out to have lung cancer. Nobody made it their desire to acquire HIV. Nobody, nobody made it uh, uh, the, the, the center of their life to have diabetes, heart disease, gout. Um, nobody ever set out to have diverticulitis, right? By the way, if you just eat a high fiber diet, you'll probably not, not never get diverticulitis. I mean, it is a diet related condition. Mm -hmm. But so many professionals say, well, if you'd only done this, this is a true story This happened to me. My stepfather was the guy who really walked nine miles to school in, this, in the snow. He was born in 1929. His mother died in childbirth. He was raised on the farms of the Great Depression by Aunt Leona. His father committed suicide because it was too tough. He really was the guy who walked nine miles to school in the snow. So uh, I was probably 25, 26. 
And I was driving between Tulsa and Houston. And uh, I started to have difficulty with my transmission. I was driving a Lincoln Town Car. I could, I could tell it wasn't slipping into gear correct. I, you just, those old cars, you knew when the transmission was going and now it was going. And it was going fast. And sure enough, I find myself somewhere on Interstate 45 between Dallas and Houston. It's midnight. I was traveling to a, a class I was actually teaching in Houston. And, uh, and, 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 and now I'm on the side of the road and I don't know what to do. Okay, it hasn't gone out yet. Can I make it to Houston or not? I don't know this. Should I call AAA? Because I, at that time I was buying like the policy that towed you anywhere, right? You get towed to Houston. Should I tow it back to Tulsa? Uh, is it okay if I drive it? Can I put some stuff from the truck stop in there and make it work good enough to get to where I was going? So I called my stepfather, who's very mechanical. He worked his entire career in the trucking industry. So I called him and I said, hey, Toby, you know, I'm between Houston and Dallas. and this is what's going on with my car, and I'm asking you for some advice since you're an expert, what should I do? And his answer was, should have taken that shop class in high school like I told you to. Thanks. Well, having taken that shop class in high school actually would not have helped me one bit in that situation. I had no tools. I, I, I was simply asking him, what course of action should I take? But it was, let me blame you for not doing this you know, whatever that was eight years earlier. We see a lack of compassion often in the medical professions. Go on Google, go on Rate My MD, and look at doctor's ratings, and you'll see that the number one complaint is not they are a bad surgeon or they misdiagnosed me, but this doctor lacks compassion. It's the number one reason for a one-star review. When you take compassion and you add it to knowledge, and this is one of the things I find in the world of hypnosis. A lot of hypnotists lack medical knowledge, but because they read articles on Facebook passed around in the form of memes, they believe they are an expert. One of the things that helps us to be intelligent is to recognize we don't know what we don't know. And it's perfectly okay to say, I don't know the answer to it. We don't need to know how to do surgery or what the cause of every condition is or even what all the various treatment options are. What we need to know is that we have a skill that can help our clients. And that skill that we're gonna be teaching them are the evidence-based approaches to professional hypnosis. And that's what we need to have a knowledge base of, a multiplicity of different interventions that can help people, not where they could be, should be, or ought to be, but where they are. I do think we also have to have knowledge of certain things. We should strive to not only increase our knowledge of techniques, but also of client presenting difficulty. We should know about, uh, about uh, diagnoses, and we should know about rule outs of those diagnoses, and we should know uh, what the characteristics of common conditions that hypnosis clients might bring to us. Not because diagnosis is our forte or our scope of practice, but because it simply enhances our ability to interact with the referral resources and to be able to, um, to develop rapport with our client who probably does know uh, the facts about their diagnosis. Now, how do you gain this medical knowledge without going to medical school? Thankfully, we live in 2019. Your client has a condition you haven't heard of it before, Google it, learn about it, read about it, right? You don't, you're, again, you're not gonna be diagnosing, you're not gonna be responsible for whether or not, you know, you know, the severity of the condition is measured accurately, but you need to have a knowledge of those things. You also have to have a knowledge of medications, and how those medications affect clients. So one of the questions I have on my intake form is, uh, have you had any recent surgeries or medical conditions? Tell me what they are. I do not care about their foot surgery seven years ago, unless for some reason it's related to why they're there today, which is not likely. I don't need to know about the tonsillectomy they had in 1967. But hey, in the last year or two, have you had medical treatment, uh, a diagnosis, surgery? Um, uh, what medications are you taking? Um, I used to tell mental health professionals back when I was doing training, you know, 25 years ago for them, when you have clients who come in, ask them what their medications are, and then go get your PDR, your physician's desk reference. And the book costs like $500, but you can buy one at the half price bookstore last year's for like 50 bucks, right? Uh, and, uh, and learn about the medications they're taking. 
that's actually how you learn about the medications. Now you don't need a PDR, you just Google, you know, what is, you know, Prozac, you know, what is, um, you know, uh, Wellbutrin, you know, what is, I mean, whatever medication they're taking, and learn about these things. Read about the interactions, the side effects, the difficulties people might have, what the expected outcomes are, what the efficacy of the medication is. Now, I'm never, because it's not in our scope of practice, to say to a client, and when you master self-hypnosis and the techniques that I'm going to be sharing with you, you won't need to take your lisanopril any longer. You can throw that blood pressure medicine out the door. We are not faith healers, so we don't make those promises that are outside of our scope of practice. Instead, what I say to my clients is this, the research shows that many people actually can use these strategies in a way that decreases not only the severity of their symptoms, but prevents their recurrence. And so, I want you to make sure you talk to your physician so he can monitor your success because he or she might want to make some changes in the medication that you have. So make sure you continue to talk to them. So we take compassion and we add it to knowledge and we work within our scope of practice. And the number one reason hypnotists have issues with any of the state bores is because they're operating outside of their scope of practice. And they're saying things like, I'm a hypnotist, come see me because I cure cancer. Okay. That's your ad. You're going to get a cease and desist letter from the medical board. You're probably going to have to defend yourself. It's going to have to cost, cost you a lot of money. Um, I'm a person who has uh, uh, belief in, um, in the profound nature of hypnosis to change us not only on a mental or emotional level, but on a physical level as well. One of my favorite books is Ernest Rossi's book, The Psychobiology of Immune System Response. It was written in the 70s. It's literally my favorite book in the world of hypnosis. What's the name of it again? Ernest Rossi. He was a contemporary of Milton Erickson's. He wrote books with Milton Erickson. The book he wrote was The Psychobiology of Immune System Response. I think every hypnotist should have that in their library. The Psychobiology, the psychobiology of Immune System Response. And in it he talks about how hypnosis profoundly impacts the structures of our brains, the structures of our bodies, the structure of all of our uh, of all of our physical um, uh, sensations. Um, so I, I believe uh, we can profoundly, and this is what Emil Coe believed with his pharmacy clients, that, the, that their auto-suggestion could profoundly alter them, not only mentally, but physically as well. So I believe that miracles can take place because the mind and the body cannot be separated. Mind is body, body is mind. There is no dichotomy. There's not a yin and yang. It is the same thing. So when we affect mind, we affect body. When we affect body, we affect mind. I became a certified personal fitness trainer years ago because I recognized that people could only function emotionally as well as they were physically. So remember, as a mental health professional doing traditional therapy, I wanted my clients to maximize their ability to function on an emotional level. So I decided I would get rid of my couch and replace it with a treadmill because actually the best medication for depression is physical activity. By the way, the best medication for high blood pressure is not lisanopril, it's sweat. It's sweat, it's physical activity. Actually, actually is a cure for a lot of different things. But we wanna fun function within our scope of practice. We wanna use non-diagnostic language. When people run into difficulty with the board, it's because they say, I'm a hypnotist and I can treat your depression. Actually. The depression, again, is a diagnostic term. I'm a hypnotist and I help people develop positive strategies that create resource states of happiness, fulfillment, and joy. By the way, that sounds a hell of a lot better than simply eliminating depression anyway, but it's the exact same thing. Instead of, I treat eating disorders, I can treat eating disorders because I'm licensed as a psychotherapist. It's a diagnosis from the DSM-5. It's the most lethal of all the psychiatric disorders. It's, of course, historically, the big news is what killed Karen Carpenter and many other deaths as a result. I worked years ago for the William Rader Eating Disorder Treatment Program. Um, he turned out to be a crackpot, but the program turned out to be, uh, uh, you know, I learned a ton working there and working with bulimia and bulrexia and anorexia. Um, um, but even in private practice, I recognize that I can't actually, I don't have the support in private practice in my office here to treat eating disorders. What do I do as a hypnotist? I help people to create lifelong patterns of healthy choices 
that can result in an improved physical condition, an improved mental condition, and help them to overcome the dangerous patterns that put them in jeopardy in the past. Do you see the difference? So we want to function within our scope of practice using non-diagnostic language, working not in opposition to, but with medical resources. So I see this on memes on the internet, and I see this on web pages regularly. Uh, it goes like this. Let me compare with you the success of hypnosis to psychotherapy. In 600 sessions of psychodynamic psychotherapy in order to get well, it took 72 sessions of behavioral therapy in order to get well, but only six sessions of hypnosis in order to get well. Two things about this. First of all, the problem with this statistic, other than it's total bullshit, we'll get to that here in a minute, the problem with it is it sets an us against them. The other problem with it, of course, is this study was done by Alfred Berrios in 1970. It's 2019. The way hypnosis was practiced then is not the way hypnosis is practiced now. The way psychotherapy was done, we don't even do behavioral therapy, that's B.F. Skinner. Okay, the way psychotherapy was done in 1970 is not the way psychotherapy is done today. Okay, uh, they were talking about Sigmund Freud here. I literally know no licensed mental health professionals who actually practice Freudian psychotherapy. I do know hypnotists who do, a lot of them, but I don't know any mental health professionals that do. Uh, the other problem with statistic, Alfred Berrios came and said, wait a minute, stop quoting my study. Not only is it outdated, but it's not even accurate. You're misrepresenting the study I've done when you say that. Uh, th this was not an apples to oranges study. Actually read the study, not just the meme. Okay? And so even Berrios disavowed the results that I see hypnotists saying. But I think the biggest problem with this is that it sets us uh, up an us against them. I'm more effective than the physician. I'm more effective than the psychologist. I'm more effective than the, than the mental health professional. Uh, no, I'm entirely different. Because if I'm a hypnotist practicing in my scope of practice, I'm not practicing medicine. I'm not practicing psychology. I'm not practicing social work. I'm practicing professional hypnosis, which is an entirely different and distinct profession. One thing the NGH has stressed that they've actually gotten correct. By the way, if you are an NGH member, you can get reciprocity membership through the ICBCH. Always like to point that out. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but, um, uh, but we have to stay within our scope of practice. And, and the reason why is it lets us build relationships with folks. So there's a lady here in, in this building who's a licensed psychologist. I got a call just a couple of weeks ago from somebody who said, hey, I want to see you for hypnosis. And I'm going to paraphrase it here. Uh, I'm nuts. I'm batshit crazy. I have all kinds of problems. I'm completely ineffective and I'm a total basket case and I'm a mess. So when can I have an appointment? And my answer was, I'm really glad you called me because hypnosis is a tremendous tool to help people gain emotional stability, problem solve in crisis situations, and feel better. But I want to connect you with the right resource. So let me connect you with a psychologist who's right down the hall from me first so that you have the right set of strategies to address the psychological difficulties you're telling me about. And and, and, and when you have a, 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 a point of stabilization, then she'll refer you back to me to teach you hypnosis so that you can make the learnings that you have in psychology a permanent part of your experience in life. Notice I'm working in collaboration with, not viewing myself as better than or different than others. So we have to stay within our scope of practice. When we combine that with what we talked about this morning, skill building hypnosis, when we see the process as something that I'm teaching somebody rather than something I'm doing to somebody. Our medical clients need us to teach them how to control pain. Our medical clients need us to teach them how to stay healthy. Our medical clients need us to teach them how to, um, uh, how to engage in, in, in activity um, that, that's healthy for them. Okay. Our, our clients need us to teach them the skill of focusing. Remember how you can focus on the wall over here? How about this skill of focusing? Chances are pretty good if you're the age that we are in this room. There's a place in your body where, you're, where, you've, where you carry the tension of the day, the chronic pain. But where is that spot? I mean, right the back of your head. Up you, it's the shoulders over here. 
How about you? Oh, lower back. Okay. How about you? Chest. Chest. Okay. Great. Have you seen a cardiologist about that? No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how, how about your shoulders and back? Okay, for me it's my feet. I've had multiple foot surgeries, and mm -hmm. and I know it's really bad when I feel it in my hip because mm -hmm. you know your, your your hips compensate for your screwed up feet, right? So that that's where I feel feel that tension, etc. Um, now here's a question you probably haven't paid attention to. In fact, are any of you feeling pain in that spot right now? I mean, you have the stress of traveling, you have the stress of sitting in a class all day, you have the stress of not doing all the stuff at home you have to do today. Uh, uh, don't even, are you aware of that spot where you're carrying the tension? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit, okay, sure. But here's the question, where are you comfortable? Where are you comfortable? What's the most comfortable part of you right now? What, what feels the best? I'll always remember Thich Nhat Hanh coming to a group of, so, uh, of mental health professionals and starting his speech by saying, I am grateful today for my non-toothache. Huh? What? Mm -hmm. right. We never pay attention to what's right with us. Mm -hmm. Did you have a toothache before? No. <laughs> Why today are you grateful for your non-toothache? Because I'm glad I don't have one. And I'm glad I didn't have one. Because other people have one that sounds horrible. Wow. When we pay attention to where we're comfortable, guess what? So on the hospital, if you go in the hospital, my friend is apparently in the hospital today. And I'm sure in his room, because the last time he was in the hospital, I was in his room, there's these faces, right? Right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, how much pain are you in? That's the question. And every time I go into anybody's room, because I always have my dryers marker, I actually cross <laughs> off how much pain are you in, and I write how much comfort are you in, and I reverse, I draw underneath here and reverse the smiley faces. Because the question the nurses should be asking is not how much pain do you feel, but how much comfort do you feel? So, in medical hypnosis, I want to teach the skill, not only of focusing on a wall, but if I can focus on a wall, I can focus on where there's comfort, which doesn't mean I don't have pain, but my pain becomes less powerful when I pay attention to where I'm comfortable, right? Doesn't mean I don't need to address it, that doesn't mean it's not a warning signal, but it means that I don't have to jump off a building today. We combine that with realistic desired outcomes. If somebody came to me and said, Richard, I have hypnosis, uh, I have hypnosis. <laughs> Richard, <laughs> I have cancer. <laughs> I heard there was a book titled The Psychobiology of Immune System Response. I want you to hypnotize me so that uh, I don't have cancer anymore. My, my answer to them is going to be Emo Kuei's answer, which is, well, I can't promise you um, that hypnosis is going to change your physical diagnosis. What I can promise you is this, that I know strategies that the research shows reduce chemotherapy, induce nausea and vomiting. And if you can keep food down, you can heal faster. Your immune system can be strong, come stronger. You will feel better. I can't promise you that I can cure cancer, but what I can promise you is this. I can promise you that even though people have said you would feel miserable because this is the worst course of treatment in the world, you can handle it in ways you didn't suspect were even possible, both emotionally and physically, which we know results in decreased stress hormones and increased immune system response. And I don't know if you believe in miracles or not, I actually do. Um, and I don't know if you'll experience uh, a miracle or not, but I do know that whether you have two months, two weeks, two years, or 20 years left, by learning hypnosis, you're going to greatly improve the quality of life that you do have. And that is awesome. Another thing about hypnosis, if I have a client who comes in, stage four cancer, says, look, the doctors have given up on me. I'm here for a miracle. Maybe the most responsible thing, thing to me to do is not to say, let me give you a miracle by conducting a session. Maybe, my, maybe the most amazing thing I can do is actually say to them, I'm really glad that you came here. Because hypnosis is a tool for dying well. Mm. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother was 94. She taught me probably the most valuable situation, lesson in hypnosis ever. You know how a prophet's not welcome in their own hometown, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my grandmother's my grandmother. I was always a little boy to her, even though I was 45, right? Mm -hmm. 
So I walked in her room, it was probably just a few weeks before she died. She was in very poor health, in very bad shape. She was lucky, she lived 93 and a half years in perfect health, and then <laughs> downhill. And she was ready to go, okay? And she was lingering, and she knew that, and she wasn't happy about that. So about three weeks before she died, and, and she looked up, I walked in the room to visit with her, and she, she looked up at me, she could barely move her very weak body, and she said to me, so you're a hypnotist. <laughs> I said, yes, honey, I'm a, we called her honey, that was her nickname. I said, I said, yes, honey, I'm a hypnotist. She said, hypnotize me. Uh, you'd like me to hypnotize you? She said, yeah, hypnotize me. I said, well, um, you know, I knew she didn't smoke, I knew she wasn't overeating. I said, well, what, would you, what would you like me to hypnotize you for? And she said, just make me feel better. Mm. So I did that day what I considered the most important hypnosis session I've ever done. And she opened her eyes probably 20 minutes later. She just looked at me with a peace and comfort. Mm. She said, thank you. Roger Moore is an expert in hypnosis and dying. His courses are worth taking. His webinars, his training is worth attending. Um, he has a course on HPTI, on uh, death and dying, hpti.org, um, uh, that he did with Kelly Woods on, uh, on death and dying and hypnosis. Sometimes the realistic outcome is helping a person to come to terms with the next phase of their experience, whatever that may be according to their belief system. That's perhaps the most compassionate thing to do. Maybe it's not compassionate to act like a faith healer and say you just didn't have enough faith. That's why it didn't go away. So when we take compassion, we combine it with knowledge, the proper scope of practice, with skill building hypnosis and a realistic desired outcome, the formula produces effective medical hypnotherapy. Uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time tomorrow teaching you some strategies and techniques that are useful. Now here's the thing, every one of these strategies that we use in medical hypnotherapy can be useful in any other form of hypnotherapy as well. That's the cool thing about hypnosis, is we can adapt a strategy or a technique to anything. We can deal with physical pain and we can deal with emotional pain. And we can often deal with it the same way. I don't know if you've ever seen Scott Sandlin do the pain train where he actually has a person drive a train, the visual image of a train through their pain. It's kind of a powerful confrontation. Well, you can do that with physical pain. He worked specifically in dental programs. So I don't know if you've ever had tooth pain, but it's about the worst pain you can have. I've been very fortunate because I've had a non-toothache most of my life, right? But I have had dental pain, and it's, there's, it's like the worst kind of pain. Um, but I've worked with a lot of clients with, with tremendous emotional pain, and I've used that pain train to, to drive through that emotional pain sometimes. I'll probably share that with you tomorrow. But I want to start with a basic strategy in medical hypnosis, and that is the strategy of, of uh, glove anesthesia. But I, I want to share it with you in a way that probably most people don't teach it, in a way that's so easy, even a beginning hypnotist can do it. But what you're going to discover is that this becomes a super powerful experience for the client. So what I'd like you, how many of you are familiar with glove anesthesia? Only Leah? All right. So glove anesthesia, let me kind of backtrack here since this is in a room filled with people experiencing glove anesthesia. It's actually an old technique. So back in the day, uh, they would actually do glove anesthesia in college classes, like um, you know, Psychology 101 to show the power of hypnosis. And they would actually use the back of a hand, and they'd actually take a C-clamp, you know what I'm talking about, a C-clamp from like somebody's garage. They would actually clamp their skin, and, and they would actually, you know, which hurts in and of itself, but they'd pinch that skin up and actually pierce it with a needle. Right. Now you can't do that anymore because it's like not hygienic, it's not safe, you don't have a piercing license, right? Um, but there were often you know, pretty dramatic demonstrations. You can probably find some of those piercing demonstrations, which by the way does show us that if you do have a friend 
who is a licensed body piercer, you can volunteer to uh, be hired as a hypnotist for those who would like to use hypnotic anesthesia as a tool for both overcoming fear and physical pain related to body piercing. Although I'm convinced people that have body piercings um, often get off on the pain. It, 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 it's something, something that's important to them. So same with tattoos. So that's a whole different story. Uh, but glove anesthesia is a process where a person creates the experience of anesthesia in their hand, like it's a glove. Now, what I typically see is the suggestion that all sensation is going away or you feel numb. Those are the words that I hear used. I hear numbness a lot. You know, go ahead, create numbness, feel numbness. Um, and then people get disappointed because they don't feel numbness. And because I'm not feeling what the hypnotist suggested, this isn't working. And because this isn't working, I can't be hypnotized. So I've made it foolproof. I've tried to make things, a lot of things foolproof. So Milton Erickson did an arm levitation. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah your hand is getting higher, 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 right? Well, that's hard to do because you're going against gravity. So instead of doing an arm levitation where it goes up, why not do a reverse levitation where it goes down? It's always going to go down. It's kind of like the puffy white cloud. It always goes off into the horizon. There isn't anywhere else for the cloud to go. That's how the world spins. So I try to take simple things and make it, or try to take complex things and make it simple, make it idiot proof. So you might not experience numbness, or you might not make your pain go away. But one of Milton Erickson's other principles was the principle of ambiguity. And so I like to use language that has no meaning except for the person who is responding to the language pattern. So the language pattern I use is the sensation of no sensation. What the hell's the sensation of no sen sensation? It's actually whatever you want it to be, right? So I found that I increased the likelihood of glove anesthesia working. Um, in fact, I've never had it not work because the meaning of the sensation of no sensation is exactly what the person who is the client wants it to be. Um, the other thing I've done in, in, in my process is, and I'm, I'm gonna go through it with you here in a minute, and then you're actually gonna go through it with each other. Um, let me just do it. Sometimes things are easier done than explained. The other thing I, I like to do though is when I'm done with the basic process of glove anesthesia, is I like to make it utilitarian. In other words, to use it. So if I can create the no sensation of no sensation here, you've just identified a spot in your body where you were carrying the tension of the day, of the travels you've had, of the chairs that you're sitting in, of the responsibilities you have. Um, and if we can transfer that sensation of no sensation to that place, we may or may not be eliminating the pain. We may or may not be making it feel better, but we are doing what's even more important than making it better or making it worse or making it different. And different is almost always good enough. The Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous goes into a long explanation as to why some people are alcoholics and some are not. It's a chapter called The Doctor's Opinion, where Dr. Silkworth wrote his opinion as to why some people were alcoholics and some were not and it has a little bit of science in it. And it explains why this person is an alcoholic and this person is not an alcoholic from a physiological perspective. And I love what the writers of the big book of AA say at the end of Dr. Silkworth's opinion, uh, which is, uh, they, they write this, they write, thank you Dr. Silkworth for your awesome explanation. Uh, essentially though, the alcoholic drinks because it changes the way they feel. Now it doesn't make them feel better. It might actually make them feel worse, but it simply makes them feel different. And that's good enough in a negative way. With glove anesthesia and dealing with pain control, simply feeling different is good enough. It's the sameness of the pain that is difficult for the chronic pain client. Anyone here have chronic pain that's been actually an issue that maybe you saw treatment for at one level or another? No, I just know someone has CRPS. Okay. For me, I've had uh, chronic pain issues, in fact. 
when I met you, I was probably rocking with a cane. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of problems in this foot over here. I went through years of struggle, so they finally had surgery. The surgery was actually a fusion and metal rods and blah, 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 blah. It actually didn't make, it, it got rid of the pain, but it made it permanently uncomfortable, right? Which isn't any better, but it's different, right? So then one day I woke up and the same symptoms I had in this foot, I had in this foot. So I got an artificial joint over here on this foot because I thought that would be better and it's not. It's the same. Uh, it's still a fusion. It's actually a fusion with a decreased likelihood of success. That was probably six, seven years ago. Um, and, and so it, they're like duck feet. They don't move and they're always uncomfortable even though the chronic pain isn't there. So this is something I've had to deal with and I've used self-hypnosis as a strategy in my own life. So two days ago, actually three days ago, I bought some new shoes. Now the only shoes I wear are these orthopedic MBT shoes that are rock bottom shoes that cost me $300 a piece. Um, they're the only shoes I've worn in the last 10 years. Uh, I bought a new pair of MBT shoes, which is what I always buy. I wore them to go on my morning walk, and when I got back, I was in such pain, I couldn't move. And, and, and I'm really bummed out because I've been walking to lose weight, and also because movement keeps you young, right? It is the fountain of youth. So, so uh, for me, it was not, oh, my foot hurts. It was, oh my gosh, am I, am I back where I was before? Has the joint replacement failed? I mean, there's an emotional pain along with the physical pain. Am I gonna be able to stand and teach my class for the next four days with Leah? Um, do I need another surgery? If the joint replacement fails, they say the only answer is to take a photograph from the hip in order to create a fusion in the toe because you already ruined the opportunity to do a real fusion because you already cut the, right? So all this is going through my head Wow, glove anesthesia. So it's one strategy for chronic pain control and it's something I actually sat down in self-hypnosis and used the day before yesterday because I went for my walk and I couldn't walk that far. I couldn't hit my 10,000 steps. And then I thought, oh, I gotta teach this class. Worse than not getting my 10,000 steps, what if I can't teach this? If I sit, teach a class from a chair, I'm boring. Every presenter knows that. And so this could be horrible. I'm catastrophizing. What do you do? Self-hypnosis. Glove anesthesia was actually the strategy I used. So I'm going to share this with you. Um, uh, make yourself comfortable, okay? So just you know, get in your chair in a place that's comfortable for you and set your hands on your lap. If you're watching this on video later, you can do this as well. Sit comfortably in the chair, let your hands be on your lap. And go ahead and close your eyes down. The great thing about doing a class with folks who have training in hypnosis and self-hypnosis is I don't have to do a long induction. In fact, my induction can be as simple as it is when I have a client in for the fourth or fifth or sixth session. Sometimes my induction then is go ahead and bring yourself to that resource state we call hypnosis. Set everything that's a distraction from your past or a fear of the future aside and be present in this moment. Breathe in, breathe out. Relax any muscles in your body that are holding the tension of the day and access that resource state that we call hypnosis. You're doing perfect. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? I always say to get CEUs with the eyes closed. Now as your hands rest on your lap, you'll be able to notice that one hand is different than the other. The hands are not the same and you might notice that for you, the left hand is the right choice. Or you might notice that the right hand is the choice that you'll make, either leaving only one hand left. It, doesn't really matter if you pick the left or the right hand. But let that hand stay on your lap and simply rise the other hand in the air for a moment. Just lift the other hand up, letting the hand that you're not focusing on simply rest on your lap. Ray, lift one of your hands. Let the other hand just rest in your lap. Now, with the hand that's raised in the air, hold out your finger and as if you're gonna point, 
you can open your eyes for a second. Go ahead and open your eyes. You, you got a pointy finger here. See, see my pointy finger? One of your fingers is pointing. And go ahead and close your eyes down. And just put the tip of that finger on the back of your other hand and tap it. Tap, 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 tap. And get rid of that pointy hand. Let it return back to where it came from. And that spot where you tapped on the back of the hand is the size of a dime or the size of the tip of your index finger. And really bring all of your attention to that spot on the back of your hand. And as you bring your attention to that spot on the back of the hand, if you pay attention, it's almost as if you can feel yourself tapping on the back of your hand still. Can you create that? imaginative experience as if you're still tapping on the back of your hand and that spot that you're able to tap on the back of your hand the size of a dime the size of a fingertip is a place where you can allow yourself to feel the sensation of no sensation go ahead and pay attention to the rest of your hand and what it feels like in your fingers on the palm of your hand and your wrist and the rest of the back of your hand but notice the absence of the sensation of sensation in that spot where you were tapping. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now imagine something. Imagine that that spot on the back of your hand the size of a dime were to expand as large as a quarter on the back of your hand. And notice in that spot, the size of a quarter of the, on the back of your hand, the sensation of no sensation. Pay attention to the feeling in the rest of your hand, the palm of your hand, the fingers, the fingernails. But that spot the size of a quarter has the sensation of no sensation. Now imagine that for some reason it expands to the size of the old Eisenhower silver dollars. Not the small Sacagawea dollars, but the big Ike dollars. The kind we used to have a long, long time ago. It covers almost the entire back of the hand become aware of the sensation of no sensation in that spot. Noticing the edges of that place where the sensation of no sensation is present has expanded, even expanding across the entire back of the hand, across the fingertips, and down the palm of the hand, and even into the wrist. And notice how heavy the hand is but how the sensation of no sensation in that hand feels so amazing. Earlier I asked you if there was a place in your body where you were carrying the tension of the day, the, the pain of the day, you were all able to identify a spot. Pick up your hand and place it on that spot, the back of your neck, the small of your back, your foot, your knee, your arm, your elbow, wherever that pain was, just put that hand that has the sensation of no sensation on that spot. And while it's on that spot, notice the sensation of no sensation can go into that place. And it feels so amazing to change the experience there. Let your hand return back to your lap. But let the sensation of no sensation remain in that place that you touched. And let the sensation of awareness return back to your hand. With the next breath, be ready to open the eyes when I count to three. And when you open your eyes, notice something amazing. And that is that the sensation of no sensation remains in that place that just moments ago was miserable and ask yourself at any level is it better now than it was before one two three wakey wakey eggs and bakey by the way something you do need to I should add this to my list of how to be an expert hypnotist develop a good snap I couldn't snap for the longest time. It took me 20 years to snap. Now I'm pretty good at snapping. Are you just as good in both hands? Yeah, but I still can't whistle. Um, <laughs> stage hypnosis training teaches you how to snap. Um, true. What was that experience like for you? What's, I mean, ask yourself, is that place that you touched different now than it was before? Yes? 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 No? I had to move it to my tooth. 
Okay, you moved it to your okay, you, uh, you really did. <laughs> so you moved it to your tooth. When you became aware of that, and when you moved that sensation, no sensation to your tooth, checked out, does it feel different than it did five minutes ago? Mm -hmm. Not only is it different, here's a question. On a scale of one to 10, how much better is it now than it was before? At least nine. At least nine. Percentage wise? Yeah, between one and 10, how much, how much oh. better is it now than it was before? Five to seven. Five to seven. Six, okay. Seven, eight. Seven, eight. Those numbers are actually higher than I thought. I thought we'd get some twos. I thought we'd get some threes. I thought we'd get a five. Everybody was over six, seven, eight. But it's nine, great to let them measure it. Ten. Yeah. Absolutely. And the reason why it's great to let them measure it is this a lot of hypnotists, back to realistic expectations, set clients up for failure by teaching them that it's all or nothing. You'll either have pain or you won't have pain. Okay. If I can decrease the quality of the pain by 20%, that's the difference between being able to get out of bed today or not. If I can decrease it another 20%, that's the difference between, between being able to go to work today or not. And if I can decrease it another 20%, that's the difference between me being able to emotionally react to my children appropriately or inappropriately, and I can save the family. And I might not reduce it 80% in the first session, but I might decrease it by 10% over nine sessions. And the stream said to the river, you go quickly, I go slowly, but together we reach the sea. It doesn't, well, Milton Erickson said, would say this, it doesn't matter if you go into trance quickly or if you go into trance slowly. The faked alternative here is what? There's only one way, to, one place to go, and that's to go into trance. So I think the GLAV anesthesia process is a useful process. We can actually build on this, apply this in a number of different situations. Let's say it wasn't a physical pain. Let's say it was an emotional pain. The emotional pain of worry. When my son was in Iraq for the year that he was there, I woke up every morning with worry, and I went to bed every night with worry. And every time I watched the news, I had worry. And every time he sent me more pictures from Iraq, I had more worry. And as a father, I had to deal with worry. It was an emotional pain. Love anesthesia again. Put your hand on that place where you're holding the worry. Create the sensation of no sensation. Not because you don't care about your son, but because today, you need a break from the intensity of it. Tomorrow, you can go back to worrying, if that's what parents do, right? But today, you can just have the sensation of no sensation. We're changing it. We're not making it better. We're not making it worse. We're simply making it different. And for most of our clients, that's a powerful change. So we can do this with both emotional and physical changes. Again, yes? No, I was just going to say, I think you're also not leaving any room for yourself when you're being that absolute about it, either no pain absolutely. or pain. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, ambiguity is our friend as a hypnotherapist. Ambiguity is actually our friend. Living in the gray area is a more effective way to live life than with black and white thinking in every area. I am very good at gray thinking. Okay. I'm not really a believer in good versus bad. Um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I've become a Taoist, right? <laughs> right? You know, I, I, I see the door, whether it's open or closed, as having opportunity on both sides. Um, living in the gray area is actually a pretty good way to go. And more of our clients need to learn how to give up the black and white thinking, not only related to physical aspects, but emotional aspects as well. So, I want you to practice this. Because again, if I teach it, that's great. But if you don't do it, you won't do it when you get home. And if you do it here, you will do it when you get home. Notice that was a hypnotic suggestion. <laughs> and you'll do it with one of your first clients, and you'll discover this is more powerful than you thought. So you take five minutes and guide him through this process. You take five minutes and guide him Should through the process. Should they maybe alternate to kind of work with different Yeah, no, then around. people have to move around. Yeah, yeah, everyone's happy. Everyone likes their partner, right? Anyone hate their partner? <laughs> yeah, OK. That so. way I mean, no one has to move around. If, if you guys were moving to other rooms, but you're not. So, so just take five minutes and guide. You know, guide each other through that process. By the way, I did not give you a script, and the reason I didn't give you a script is because I don't think it's that difficult, right? Notice, 
one hand is different than the other hand, take the hand. No, usually I tell them, I'm going to ask you to do this. Well, I forgot to do that. So I said, go ahead and open your eyes, pointer finger, right? Okay. Did it bother you that you opened your eyes? No. Actually went deeper. Right, exactly, because it's, fra it's, fraction, it's fractionation. So, so again, you know, there's not really a right or a wrong way to do this. You, you just, you know, you want them to tap and then bam, they're done with it, they get rid of their hand. And it's not rocket science. Create that sensation of no sensation. Expand it the size of a dime, size of a quarter, size of an Eisenhower dollar. By the way, why do I make the big deal out of the Eisenhower dollar, not the second Jawea dollar? Again, it's it, it's interesting. I forgot there was a second Jawea dollar. I, for, I haven't seen an Eisenhower dollar since I was a kid. Everybody knows who they are. I mean, don't, if you do this with a 15-year-old, they might not, but uh, everyone else knows what they are. Um, you know, I've long been out of circulation, but we all know exactly what that is. Um, if you have a Canadian, you have to talk about loonies and toonies, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, none of us are Canadians, so we're safe. Um, but uh, but. You know, everyone knows the size of a dime, the size of a quarter, the size of a, an old silver dollar, right? That's almost the whole back of the hand. And if you can go from, if I said, tap on your hand, notice the sensation of no sensation, now make your whole hand have the sensation of no sensation, it wouldn't work. But expand it to the size of a quarter. It's amazing how that happens. The size of an old silver dollar. If you wanted to go real slow, a Kennedy half dollar, uh, now not the size of a dollar. Now the back of the hand, now the front of the hand. So you're incrementally creating the sensation of no sensation. Now touch that place, that place you identified earlier. If they identified a spot earlier, by the way, you don't have to ask, was that successful to you? Because if they actually touch something, it worked for them. Or they'd be like, hey, this isn't working, why am I touching anything, right? 